Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. My guest on today's show is historian, philosopher, Freemason, antiquarian, jurist, lay theologian, writer, mystic, radio, TV personality, showman, best-selling author, CEO, and lawyer, Robert W. Sullivan IV. I'll be talking with Robert about his outstanding series of books on cinema symbolism. This includes a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies, more esoteric imagery in popular movies and the mysteries of occult Hollywood unveiled. Robert W. Sullivan IV, welcome to Paranormal Yacker. Uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. What, Robert, was the first movie you saw in which you spotted some type of esoteric symbolism that in all probability went over the heads of other moviegoers and so they never noticed it? The first movie that I really saw it on the level I think you're asking me is First Night National Treasure movie, which came out in 2003, 2004. And what a lot of people were not aware of is that ritual, or excuse me, that film is actually a Masonic ritual on film. It is the high degree uh, ceremonial known as the Royal Arch of Enoch. That movie depicts the whole ritual from start to finish on film. And that was really sort of the first movie where I thought, oh God, these guys in Hollywood are really encoding a lot here. To be fair, when I was a boy growing up, I was of course a huge Star Wars fan. And it became known to me, uh, you know, when I was in high school, that that was sort of a, a retelling of the Joseph Campbell monomyth, sort of the ancient mythology is just rebranded into a space western. But really, the, the first movie where you could see that there was something going on, and most people weren't aware of it, was this first national treasure movie where this was really this royal arch ritual put on film. If one asks any fan of the James Bond movie franchise what his code name is, they will not hesitate to tell you it's 007. But if you ask them why 007 is James Bond's numerical designation, nation, they probably won't know the answer. You do. So, Robert, what is the answer as to why James Bond is called 007? This is a tribute to a man named Dr. John D, who was Queen Elizabeth I uh, back in Tudor, England, a court astrologer and spy. He worked with people like Sir Francis Walsingham, and actually when D toured uh, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, he served as Queen Elizabeth's spy, keep, keeping tabs on Rudolph II, people like that. And when he would write correspondences back to her, he would sign them 007, a 007. And the significance of it was it was two zeros and a line over the zeros and then the, the line down. Um, it was meant to look like spy glasses, the implication being that he was her eyes in the field and that the correspondence or the letter was for her eyes only. Of course, if you look at it, it's 007, 007. And of course, this is why Ian Fleming uh, decides to pay homage uh, to Dr. John D and give his spy master D's moniker of 007. While we're on the subject of James Bond, I didn't know until you wrote about it that Ian Fleming, author of the James Bond books, was friends with occultist Aleister Crowley. And the James Bond movies feature elements of Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, and alchemy. Can you give me some examples? During World War II, Crowley was a double agent for the British Empire, and his handler in MI5, MI6, MI6 was none other than Ian Fleming, who of course went on to write the James Bond stories. Crowley turns up in Fleming's stories. He is Le Schiff in uh, Casino Royale and Blofeld, the head of Spectre, is also Aleister Crowley, specifically on, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. This is where Blofeld is trying to fake his coat of arms and turn himself into royalty. This is what Crowley was trying to do when he was in Cairo, Egypt. He was running around calling himself Scottish nobility. So when you watch On Her Majesty's Secret Service or you read the novel, the whole notion of Blofeld pretending to be nobility is a direct correlation with Aleister Crowley. If you're familiar with the occult, the Gnosticism and alchemy, you will realize that sort of the James Bond films sort of run on the same track. If you have this over-the-top villain who's ultimately trying to take over the world, you look to movies like Goldfinger, where the, the golden finger, the golden touch, I mean, this is the alchemist who is trying to transmute the gold in Fort Knox to make it worthless, and in doing so, making his gold stash worth 10 times more. And then you have elements coincidentia oppositorum, the union of opposites. This is where Bond inevitably has to unite with the sacred feminine, the, the Bond girl. And of course, this after this happens, this always equips him spiritually, physically, and mentally to give him the tools to go and defeat the arch villain. So, I mean, we see, and we see that in every Bond film that's out there. You have the guy who, who makes the gadgets, the wisdom provider, Q, uh, quartermaster. You know, we think of, of wisdom providers in history, people like Hermes Trismegistus. So you, when you watch the Bond films, and this is all coming from Crowley. I mean, there, there's no question about it. You know, you will definitely see Crowley and by default, this occult fingerprints all over the works of Crowley. And of course, they make their way into the movies. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the James Bond uh, material, very esoteric to say the least. 
At the very beginning of 1978's Superman, giant faces appear on screen and they pass judgment on General Zod and his lieutenants. There is a backstory to that. You, Robert, know it. What is it? This is absolutely true. And and I'm routinely asked, um, you know, where do these movie makers draw inspiration from? One of the sources, one of the great treasure troves is, of course, history. They see something in the past and they put it in their film, something that's maybe a little obscure. And we see this in the in the first Superman movie. Um, what you are looking at when they judge the Zod trio, this is of course a reenactment of the Star Chamber, which was this uh, court in England uh, that served for many, many years, where you would basically go in front of it without a lawyer, and they would basically pronounce you guilty with any sort of due process, any sort of hearing. It was ultimately put out of business by the Long Parliament in the mid-1600s. But when you watch that opening sequence in Superman, a retelling of this ancient court from England known as the Star Chamber, and they actually made a movie called the Star Chamber, which is also a direct result of the England Star Chamber. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When filmmakers need inspiration, um, one of their source materials is, of course, uh, the historical record. Where, Robert, does the name Luke Skywalker or Star Wars fame come from? It's a great question. And what what we are dealing with when we are dealing with the Star Wars movies, and especially four, five, and six, and I mentioned this a couple of moments ago, is this is a retelling. These stories are a space opera retelling of what Joseph Campbell, the famous American mythologist, called the monomyth. And it's mythology. It's the same thing, just rebranded, where you have the solar hero going out on a quest, meeting the old hermit character, confronting some dark evil lord, and ultimately emerging triumphant. If you want, if you're interested in this, read the book The Hero of a Thousand Fate with a Thousand Faces by Campbell. The name Luke Skywalker is, is exactly what he is. Luke Skywalker, like Harry Potter or Frodo Baggins, personifies the sun, uh, the solar hero. And the name Luke Skywalker means just that. The name Luke comes from the word lux, meaning light. And of course, what light walks across the sky every day? The sun. So again, Luke Skywalker is one of many solar heroes and heroines and mythological characters. His is probably the, one of the most recent ones. Egyptian symbolism, astrotheology, and numerology are incorporated in the Omen trilogy. Could you, Robert, elaborate on that? You will see loads of Egyptian mythology. In the first movie plays with it a little bit. It's really the second and third movies that really delve into this. And in the third one, we'll see in the studio sets the Egyptian mythology. The whole reason for doing this and the Neoplatonic astrotheology theological allegory. It's ultimately about the rise of the Antichrist, darkness, and the return of Jesus, the light, the sun. And when you watch the second movie in the trilogy, Damien, Omen 2, this is where the Antichrist is coming of age. And if you pay very close attention to that movie, you will notice that it is entirely set in autumn and winter. It is never set in spring. And there's a reason for that, of course. In the autumn, this is when the sun, Jesus, is weakening. And then, of course, in winter, it's dead. And, of course, thus, the Antichrist darkness is reigning supreme. And then, of course, we get to the third Omen movie where the Antichrist Damien Thorne is now in, in his 30s and of course Christ is going to return when else but at the vernal equinox when the stone of winter is rolled away and the sun returns uh, triumphantly. Believe it or not and this is something these filmmakers also mess around with is release dates and Damien the final movie in the trilogy the final conflict was actually released on the vernal equinox I believe of 1980 or 81 and the reason for that is it signifies the return of light the, the return of Jesus the sun of course Damien Thorne personifying darkness is thus is thereby defeated. So yeah, I mean, when, when you're dealing with the Omen movies, you get a lot of astrotheological neoplatonic imagery. And this is, again, one of many. Black Swan director Darren Aronofsky employed mirrors in his multi-award winning movie for reasons that were symbolic and relevant to the, the development and flow of the film. What, Robert, was the symbolism behind those mirrors? A lot of times the use of a mirror is used to denote the character's darker self or that the darker side is emerging. And Aronofsky really uses this uh, masterfully in Black Swan. You'll find it in other films too, but in Black Swan, he really uses the mirror to convey the idea of the ballerina, Nina Sayer's dark side coming to life. In fact, he does it so well that when you watch the movie, the reflection in the mirror begins to take on its own personality. It actually starts moving in different directions than she does. And it's obviously alive, essentially. And what that is signifying is that her darkness, her, her shadow self, her repressed shadow that she's trying to suppress is now coming to life. If you're familiar with the works of the psychology of Carl Jung, people like that, that movie is really a masterpiece in the exploration of the Jungian shadow and related to sexual awakening, how they're linked together. It's, it's a very good movie. The Exorcist is considered one of the scariest and 
best horror movies of all time. There was much occult symbolism in it, both outright and veiled. Could you, Robert, tell me about some of that symbolism? The Exorcist is a fantastic movie. It's one of my all-time favorites. Again, we are dealing with a filmmaker, William Friedkin, who really understood the material and really deployed it well to convey, again, more to your subconscious, more than to your you know conscious self, this whole notion of God versus the devil, Jesus versus Satan. And it's played out in, again, the whole idea of light versus darkness. For instance, um, when we are introduced to the Jesuit at the very beginning of the film, Father Marin, it's set in the heat of the desert, the sun. Of course, you know, Jesus personifies the sun, the symbol of the Jesuits is the sun. So this is introducing light, the, the warmth, divine light into the film. And of course, as it progresses, the sun weakens. And of course, this gives license when, when the sun weakens and it gets dark out. This, of course, gives the demon license to roam and wreak all kind of havoc. Pay attention to it because at the very beginning of it, when Chris McNeil is walking home from the, the movie set at Georgetown, she passes trick-or-treaters. That is intentionally done to signify the midway point between the vernal equinox and the winter solstice when the sun is really in retreat and the days are really beginning to get short, light is decreased, and darkness reigns. And of course, this is right when the demon starts to run amok. And again, once the demon takes full possession of her, it gets freezing in her bedroom. You can see your breath. And again, this is trading on the notion of Dante Alighieri's Inferno, where the lower levels of hell are freezing, and that's designed to invoke that in your subconscious mind. Again, one of the best examples in The Exorcist, and this is something that a filmmaker named Ari Aster uses years later in movies like Midsommar and Hereditary, is The Exorcist has one of the examples of foreshadowing in a film you will ever find, and it's it's very well done. It's the scene where Father Karras is in the language lab at Georgetown University, and they're playing the little girl's speech. They're playing it backwards, and he's saying, oh, you know, what is that? And he says, oh, it's English backwards. If you pay attention to it, right as they're zeroing in, they're behind glass. Above the window is a Japanese word. It's, it's Tuskegee. You see it plain as day if you know to look for it. That is a Japanese word that means help. Me. And it's, of course, the very next scene. It's fantastic foreshadowing. The very next scene is while Father Harris goes up into the little girl's bedroom and sees help me stenciled across her belly, meaning she's trying to, you know, call for help, get the demon out of me. This is just but a few examples of some of the imagery and techniques uh, going on inside The Exorcist. Again, this is a movie that is very layered with uh, occult symbolism. As, as many religious films are. The Wizard of Oz is an American musical fantasy that starred the late Judy Garland. It is considered a classic and watched every year by millions of families when it's released on TV. What I'm sure those families don't realize is the mysterious underlying symbolism in it. What, Robert, is that symbolism? The Wizard of Oz is a very complex movie because it's multi-layered. And I will try to condense the answer as best I can. It's one of those movies that I love talking about and dissecting because more than one level of a layer of symbolism on it. Of course, on its surface, it's about this little girl who goes on to this mystical land, has an adventure, and meets some strange characters and eccentric figures and comes home. Period. End of story. Of course, there are two other layers that are much more veiled. One is more known than the other one. The first is that The Wizard of Oz is a political allegory, signifying a late 19th century socio-economic political discourse climates in the United States. For example, Dorothy is a Theodore Roosevelt. The little dog Toto is a play on the word teetotaler, which is William Jennings Bryan. He didn't drink, and he was William McKinley's main challenger for the presidency. The Wizard of Oz is William McKinley, the 25th president. And of course, he wanted to use gold uh, to back paper money, the gold standard. This is why the Yellow Brick Road, the gold standard, always leads to Emerald City or paper money. The three travelers with Dorothy, the scarecrow is the American farmer. The tin man is the American laborer. You will notice when we first are introduced to him, he is frozen. He can't move. Uh, he's rusted. And this represents a Great Depression recession uh, that occurred in 1896, where thousands upon thousands of laborers were laid off. If you remember in the film, what got him moving and dancing around? It was oil. They had to oil him up to get him moving. And this is symbolizes J.P. Morgan and Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, the head of the oil company, Standard Oil, which, of course, put the American laborer back to work. What that signifies is the Cowardly Lion personifies two people, Williams, Jennings, Bryan, and Eugene Debs, who were the two challengers to McKinley, but never went anywhere. Um, so that's the political allegory in, in a nutshell. Of course, the guy who wrote, the author of The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum, was a member of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophy Society. So we have this neo-Gnostic encoding in The Wizard of Oz, much like we find in other stories like Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll 
where you have the girl being whisked away to this magical land, interacting with these strange creatures, ultimately to have what you would call a Gnostic epiphany, where you would come to know thyself and awaken to your true calling. And we have this in The Wizard of Oz, where at the very end, she realizes that there's no place like home. This is Dorothy Gale's Gnostic awakening. And of course, then she's transported back home. When you're watching The Wizard of Oz, we have the political allegory, but then we have this sort of initiation into the ancient mystery tradition, where this little girl or this young lady is going on this magical quest to trying to find her true identity. Um, and again, we'll see elements of, of theosophy in this. For instance, she walks on the yellow brick road. This is a reference to the golden paths of religion, which, according to Blavatsky, ultimately led to a false messiah, the Demiurge. And we find out that, of course, where does it lead to? Well, the Wizard of Oz. Well, he's a fraud, the little man behind the curtain. And, and the moral to the story was, beware of organized religions. They may not be what they seem. And again, this is a very ancient Gnostic tenet. I mean, this goes back to Valentinus and characters like that. So when you're watching The Wizard of Oz, whether it's on Blu-ray, DVD, or when they run it annually, pay close attention to it because there's a lot going on in it. What, Robert, is the hidden symbolism and esoteric imagery in movies such as the Harry Potter saga and the Chronicles of Narnia? This is the solar journey. This is the solar hero. When we are looking at Harry Potter and Narnia, we're, we're looking at you know, almost like Star Wars with another name. I mean, what do all these stories have in common? It's about a person or persons who are living everyday lives and are plucked from those everyday lives, ultimately transported to a magical land where they interact with strange and eccentric characters to go on and defeat some dark, evil overlord of some kind. That's what this is. I mean, if, if this sounds like, you know, the Christ story, it should, because that's pretty much what it is. In Harry Potter, again, we have the Christ figure who interacts with the hermit figure, the Hermes Trismegistus character, Dumbledore. The evil figure, the devil, is, of course, the Death Eaters, Lord Voldemort. In the Chronicle of Narnia, we have the same thing with the Winter Queen. And then, of course, we have probably in, in Narnia, the greatest Neoplatonic Christ figure of them all, Aslan the Lion, which is a reference, of course, to Leo the Lion, which is the soul house of the sun. Of course, Aslan is a clear Christ counterpart. I mean, that's irrefutable. When you're dealing with movies like, and the stories like Harry Potter, Narnia, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, again, it's it's a retelling of the solar monomyth. And again, it's, you know, the Christ story, the savior figure who goes off, has this massive adventure and defeats some dark overlord. We'll find it also, I should mention, in the Dune story, the Frank Herbert Dune. It, it's the same exact thing. In the cinema symbolism three, the mysteries of occult Hollywood unveiled, you write about Gnosticism, Freemasonry, black magic and Kabbalah being incorporated into many movies arranging from 1932's The Mummy to 2017's The Shape of Water. Can you tell me about some of those movies and the symbolism in them? The Mummy with Karloff um, has a lot to do with Freudian psychology. It has to do with the animation of dead things. It's the Osirian myth. It ties into things like automatons and robots. What is the mummy? He's ultimately this dead man who is ultimately resurrected. When we're dealing with that, you are getting involved with things like Kabbalistic golems and hermetic statues, things like that. So, you know, the mummy is in its sense a form of Kabbalistic magic. It's it's the resurrection. It's the creation of a human life form out of something that's dead. The Shape of Water is a very alchemical movie. It involves very significant because it uses the color red. That is a, a very key tip off to alchemical movies. What's really interesting about uh, The Shape of Water is it ties into a movie, another Guillermo de Toro movie um, that I analyzed in Cinema Symbolism 2 called Crimson Peak. Both movies use a red and green color scheme. Although, I don't even know if the Toro is aware of it. I, I think he is in Crimson Peak. I don't know if it just held over into Shape of Water. It, it has more significance in Crimson Peak than probably Shape of Water. But yeah, I mean, alchemy. And when I say alchemy, what I usually refer to is an alchemical movie is, is a movie that has to deal with the transition of self. You do have movies that have to do with like transmuting base metal into gold, things like that. And again, I think of the movie Goldfinger, you know, the James Bond film. When I get into alchem, when I say an alchemical movie, a lot of times what I'm referring to is a character, usually the protagonist, who undergoes a substantial change, who starts as one thing and then morphs into something else. We find this in The Shape of Water. We find this very clearly in movies like Black Swan. And we also find this uh, theme of alchemy in movies like The Shining by Stanley Kubrick. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy the books you've written about cinema symbolism and also learn about other books you've authored, how can they do that? They should buy them. They're on all the main internet websites or vendors. Um, you can get them on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, 
screen. They're in the print edition or the ebook. Uh, my website is my name. It's Robert W. Sullivan IV for the fourth. Um, there are links there to purchase the books. There's information about me, information about upcoming shows I'm going to be on, shows that I've been on, such as this one will be posted there. Uh, so you can go on the internet uh, and find me at Robert W. Sullivan IV.com. And again, my books, the Cinema Symbolism books, the Royal Archer Enoch book, and the Pact with the Devil book, which will be getting a new edition next month. Those can be found on all the major online vendors. Great. Robert W. Sullivan IV, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It's been a truly wonderful experience yakking with you. Well, thank you, Stan, for having me on. It was my pleasure to be here. And when a new book comes out, maybe we'll do it all over again. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure, you're amongst the first to receive new interviews when they're released and to have access to previous ones, subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen. Thank you.